Good evening, man. Time to start our services. Uh, I think everybody that's here were here this morning, so I'm not going to go through all these announcements. Just well, everything's here in the bulletin board. And just remember to keep all these people in their prayers and pray for a good recovery for those who are sick. And on the events, there will be an elder preacher's meeting tomorrow evening at 4 30. Is that right? 4 30. And then the ladies' night out will be at Western Sizzling at 5 30 Thursday. And polishing the pulpit. That'll be August the 17th through the 25th in Sevierville, Tennessee. And we will have a guest speaker on August the 21st. And is there anything else in that uh, event? Please? Okay. Uh, Mark is going to be leading the same thing tonight. Our golden hand. <coughs> Number 275. Jesus calls us for the mold of our life. While restless Eve, day by day, sweet voice sounded, saying, Christian, Bow with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for all the blessings that you rain down on us while we're here on this earth. 
Father, they're too numerous for us to count. We thank you for it. Father, we thank you for your Son who gives us the hope of eternal life in heaven. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to gather here and to worship your high and holy name without fear from our government. Father, we pray that this might always be so. Father, we ask that you would be with the number of the members of our number who are sick or suffering. You would be with them and be with those who are, are treating their illnesses. That they might have a quick recovery and be able to be with us once again. Father, we pray that you will go with us and guide us as we go about our lives. Help us, Father, to be good examples of you to those around us. Help us, Father, to, to shine your light to those that we come in contact with. Pray, Father, that you will forgive us for we have sinned against you. And we pray, Father, that when our lives here are, that we might have that happen and turn home with you in heaven. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <coughs> Next song will be number 312. <laughs> Brightly be. Our Father's mercy from His last house evermore unto us He gives a keeping of the lights of the shore. Thank you. 
So if you picked up a calendar this morning, there were some wrong dates on there. So it has been reprinted and I changed the color so you wouldn't get confused. So the yellow one is not valid, but the orange one that's back there is valid. So the birthdays are correct, but the anniversaries were a month ahead. So if you want to be a month ahead on your anniversaries, you can just go right ahead. But uh, uh, it's been corrected and so it's back there for uh, you to pick one up and enjoy that. It, the, the passage that was read just a few moments ago by John sounded a little depressing, didn't it, when he read it? And yet, as the Hebrew writer looks at these things and we talk about faith, and I thought about this on the way here tonight, this lesson is kind of a, a sharpening your sword type of a lesson. It is definitely not for those who aren't Christians. I guess if you're not a Christian, you, you can certainly get something from it. But it's for those really who are of the faith, who need to sharpen their sword or sharpen their knife or something like that. Because it's really talking about a, a faith in a time when things aren't so well. And you can just pick some of these things out of these passages. Now, I will tell you, we're going to cover verse 35 and 36 tonight, and then probably next next Sunday night or, or a song service. So the Sunday night after that, we'll cover um, probably 37 and 38. So we won't get to any stonings tonight. We won't get to any, any killings of the sword. We're not going to get to, to when they went about in sheepskin and goats and, and all those things tonight. But we will look at the, the subject of being raised from the dead, if you will. 
We look at, we'll look at mocking and flocking and all these things. And, and so when you just hear these things, they kind of depress you and say, well, how can anybody live in that type of environment? But yet in the Old Testament, and that's what this is referring to, people lived in that type of environment. Now, I will also let you know that we'll, when we'll notice tonight, we see some of this in the New Testament times that these people were living in. I don't know if we see that today. And after New Testament times, in, in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th, and 6th and centuries, you see a lot of this persecution of Christians. And it makes things difficult. You know, to be a Christian in, in our century, well, in our country, it, it's pretty good, isn't it? You can go to church, you can not go to church, you can do what you want, you have rights, and, 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 and you, you know, if you, you decide, well, I got it this morning, I don't feel good, I don't want to go to church, well, you can do that, and nobody's going to do anything, or you can come to church, and people are going to be happy you're there, but if you're not going to face any consequences, well, it's not like that in every country, even in our day and age today. I was watching a tape from North Korea on the news the other day, and, and I was noticing how their lines of military are walking in a straight line, and everyone is moving their arm at the same time and their foot at the same time. And it is perfect. And there's not a person in rows and rows and rows of military, not a person out of step. And you just wonder, well, how can that be so perfect? And the answer is, if you're not, they torture you till you die. That is today in North Korea, a country that we're familiar with because of the wars over there. So, so you can kind of see persecution in every day, at every time, at every age. And certainly if you're a Christian over there, you're meeting secretly, and it's a privilege and it's an honor to, to be able to do that. And, and, and so you you have to ask the question, is my faith stronger when I go through something? Or is my faith stronger when I don't go through a test at all? These people in, in this day and time are saying life has become difficult as a Christian, and it had. And we're just going to, you know, life would be much easier if we just went back and lived the old Jewish faith like we used to live and, and don't worry about any of this Christianity and don't have any of this right responsibility and, and all these things. And, and so the Hebrew writer's point is, listen, to, to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus is so much better. And that's his key word, better, better, better. You see that throughout all the book of Hebrews. And then he brings out some, some faith examples in the whole book of Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 1 verse 1. And so as we study this chapter, before we look at before we looked at triumph heroes who won military victories, and that was a couple Sunday nights ago. I think we spent two Sunday nights in verses 32 through 34, these heroes that we looked at, and there were several who had military victories and other things. Tonight we're going to look at the, the second section of this section that pertains to suffering heroes. And what it's like to suffer. And as Christians, we must not let everything of this world get us down, but we must look forward with our faith towards heaven. Not, not looking backwards and, and all the things that, that, that have tied us down or mistakes with things that have happened in the past. And, the, and sometimes we like to do that. Old things were you know, better a couple of years ago or 50 years ago or whatever spot we want to put in there. But we have to look, you know, realize when we live and what we live and how we live and, and begin to look forward to the cross, be forward to heaven. Because that's our goal. Now we'll notice... We notice Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. 
And so this is our goal to look forward. So tonight we'll look at a couple of things. First, we'll notice that, that some suffer greatly in spite of their faith. Have you ever noticed that? You can have someone that is in the church that has the strongest faith. And, and, and they're excited to, to be at worship and Bible study every time the doors are open. And they just, you, if you could measure their faith and you would say, that person has great faith. That person is a man or a woman of God. And then you see something begin to happen in their life and they begin to suffer. I'd say a couple of things about that. We'll look at that verse in just a moment. But, but I think Satan looks for people of great faith and attacks them. If Satan is trying to work in your life, if, he, if he's knocking on your door, that means you must be doing something good. If he's not bothering you at all, then, then, then I would reevaluate things and say, you, you know, I, I might need to spend more time in the Word, or I might need to spend more time in prayer or something, you know, more, spend more time dedicated towards God because if Satan's not bothering you, then I haven't bothered him. And so you see this attitude of some suffer greatly in spite of their faith. Let's notice the verse that we're going to look at tonight, Hebrews 11, verse 35. Women receive back their dead by resurrection. And this, we'll look at two Old Testament passages, one in 1 Kings, one in 2 Kings tonight, that really kind of bring this home. Now, I want to tell you these are special circumstances with what the Bible would call men of God, which these men of God are prophets of God, and not only prophets of God, if you had to list the top 10 prophets of God, these two would be probably the number one and number two. And I know what you're thinking, Elijah and Elisha, and you would be right. There's some of the top prophets of God that we see, and so we'll be talking about that. So if you have a top prophet of God, then you're going to have some strange circumstances. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life, heaven. And so this verse begins to tell the other side of the story. If you go, some suffer greatly in spite of their faith. However, God in his wisdom provides evidence that the righteous can look forward to being raised to the resurrection. Isn't that what it's all about? You know, we stand there and friends and family and those and we look at their life and celebrate their life if they have been here but we really look forward to what the resurrection because we're all subject to that same thing from a beginning date to an ending date on this earth and unless the Lord comes before we die we're all subject to that first death that physical death and we don't like it we don't want to talk about it we don't want to look at it we don't want to notice it but but it's going to happen to every single person on this earth unless the Lord comes and, and the only thing that we can hope for is the second death that we are raised from that and we base everything that we have on that resurrection now. When Jesus raised Lazarus, you begin to see the power of that. When God raised Jesus, you begin to see the power of that raising. And certainly if you have your Bibles tonight, turn over first to first Kings. Chapter 17, 1 Kings chapter 17. A, a little bit of a lengthy text, beginning in verse 17. 1 Kings 17, verse 17. And this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. So the son became ill. We're going to call this son a, a, a young man. Well, I don't think we're, we're given his age here, but we know that he is a, a young man at this point, or a little boy, as some might call him. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. 
So, so we see this as the story unwinds. It's very quickly going from zero to dead. And we could put a period in the story there and say, well, that's the end of it and walk away. But that's not the end of it because of faith. Now, I want you to know, once again, these are strange circumstances. These are Old Testament circumstances. And these are the two mightiest prophets of God that you'll probably see in the Bible. And, and if they were here in our circle, well, well, maybe this might happen today, but they're not. So she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and cause the death of my son. Now, now they had this Old Testament and sometimes a little bit in the New Testament. And I can understand how, how, how this goes on. You see a couple examples of this in the New Testament. If something happens to someone, it's because of what? Something that I did. If something goes wrong, it's because of sin that's in my life. They associate the two together. In other words, if, you know, something happened, well, it's because I sinned. And, and so that could be a sin that I did last week, a sin last month, a sin last year. But, you know, so the woman says that I, and she, he was, Elijah was staying at this woman's house to kind of back up in the story a little bit. And, and he's like, she's basically saying, why have you come to my house? Now my son is dead because you've come to my house. And because he's dead, I'm remembering all the sin that is in my life. And she's, it's almost like a smorgasbord. Pick, pick your sin that you've done in the past that might have something to bring this bad luck or, or this punishment to you. And, and so, you know, of course we know that this is not what Elijah had come to do. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms, carried him up into Upper, the upper chamber, where, upper, excuse me, upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. So I want you to notice what he does. He takes the, 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 the boy, you know, so that's why I say it's a boy, enough to take, could be a, a, even a, a, almost a baby, he takes the boy out of her arms, carries him upstairs to the upper chamber, lays him on the bed where he had been lodging. Now, this is where it kind of gets to, and I want you to notice that Elijah and Elisha do this the same way. He cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow whom I soldiered by killing her son? Question for God. Of course, that's not the case. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life Come into him again, and the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came to him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber into the house, and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord, your mouth is truth. Now, I don't know why this boy died in the first place. Nowhere in the Bible does it say why this boy died. The point is the faith that the woman had, that Elijah had, and, and you see the faith that, that grew. It's a faith sharpening, remember. And, and the woman's faith seemed to be pretty good at the beginning, but when she found out that Elijah was able to raise the boy, she had more faith in the prophet of God and more faith in God himself. And so you see that faith grow. Once again, this is an odd circumstance. Now we flip over to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse 18. A little bit longer text over here, 18 through 37 we'll look at this evening. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 18 through 37. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. So this boy here, another boy, uh, had to be old enough to go out and work in the fields, whatever age that might be. Old enough to get some work done, so probably a little older than the last child. He said to his father, Oh my head, my head. The father said to his servants, 
carry him to his mother. You know, the chick's off, that sick child, what do you do? You take him to the mother. And so he carried him over to him, and, and he went and lifted him and, and brought him to his mother as the child sat on her lap till noon, then he died. And she went up and laid on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and, and went out. So she took the child up to where Elisha, the other prophet that we're talking about, had been staying. And he laid the, bed, the child on the bed of Elisha and, and closed the door behind her and she left the house. Now she's going to go searching for Elisha. Verse 22, then she called her husband and said, send me one of the servants, one of the donkeys, that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, why will you go to him today? It's neither a, a new moon nor Sabbath. She said, all is well. Uh, I don't know if I agree with, with the way this woman was, but, but, but the servant of God can certainly see it in her attitude. We'll notice that in a few minutes because, you know, this is one of those things where people walk into church and you're like, how you doing? Great. How you doing? Good. How's everything? Wonderful. When, when all the time the, your world could be what? Falling apart around you and you don't give the answer that's really on your mind. Well, we're kind of like that, aren't we? You know, I'm, well, if you really want to know, I've got this problem, I've got that problem, I've got this other problem, I've got all these things going on, and I don't know what to do. If you said that, people would look at you, okay. I'm not going to ask that question next week. You know, and that's kind of what we're afraid of. In, in reality, we should be able to help each other. And so this woman, this keeps on being her answer, all is well, all is well. And she, you know, she tells her husband, you know, nothing's going on now. I'm just going to go find the prophet of God and on a day that I normally wouldn't find the prophet of God because all is well. She saddled the donkey. She said to her servant, urge the donkey on. In other words, make the donkey go as fast as the donkey can. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. In other words, I understand I'm a woman. And sometimes you might take the donkey slower when you got a woman on. But let's get this donkey going. Let's go. We, we're, time is a necessity here. She... So she set out and came to the man of God in Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, Look, there's a Shulamite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, It is all well with you. It's all well with your husband. It's all well with your child. And she answered, What? All's well. Everything's all right. Don't even worry. Well, this is why I don't necessarily agree because I'm, if I'm going out to the man of God, Elisha, and I'm looking for him and I need something from him, the man of God, I'm going to say, no, all is not right. My, my son is, is dead. I need you to come immediately. But I just want you to notice how she handles this. And when she came to the mountain of the man of God, she, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. For she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and, and not told me. Then she said, Did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? And he said to Gehazi, Tie up your garment, take my staff in your hand, and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not reply. And, and lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will never leave you. So she arose and followed, he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore he returned to meet him and told him, The child has not awakened. And Elisha came into the house. He saw the child lying dead on his bed, so he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. He went up, he laid on the child, just like Elisha, put his mouth on it, a little bit different, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, so some of that's the same, and he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house. 
and went and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes, then summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shulamite. So she called, so he called her. And, and when she came to him, he said, Pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground, and she picked up her son and went out. So without faith, the grieving mothers of the children. Praise the life again. These resurrections probably would not have happened. Now in the New Testament, women were in some way connected with all the raising from the dead. So notice this. This is actually Luke 7. We don't have time to turn all these passages. So I'll just refer to Luke 7, verse 11 through 7. One raised was the widow from Naaman. The daughter of Jairus was in Mark chapter 5. Mary and Martha were with Jesus when he raised Lazarus in John 11. We know that story. Although little was, was taught in the Old Testament concerning the afterlife, many of the Jews believed in it, and the common people saw that many scholars did not. Others mentioned in the text were tormented, not accepting their release. And, and the word used here for torment it normally refers to a drum made with a stretched animal skin, but in the context of torment, it means a wheel on which a person was stretched and then beaten to death. And so we know this torment was, was hard. And this happened to in the case of Eliezer, one of the Jewish scribes, who in the Maccabean days allowed himself to be stretched and beaten to death, rather than tasting unlawful food. That wasn't even a case of confessing Christ. That was a case of tasting unlawful food. If you can imagine them put you on a wheel and stretch your body and beat you as you're being stretched. And these people had only to renounce their faith in God and the persecution would have stopped, but that was too great a price for godly people to pay and they endured it because they wanted to obtain a better resurrection. Well, secondly, this evening, we see mocking often came to God's people. Mocking. You're a Christian? Now, I will say that sometimes you get a little bit of that today, but I don't think it's to any extent that, that they have seen in the past. And notice the passage in verse 36. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. So this even happened to Jesus on the cross. As you recall, when Jesus is on the cross, Matthew 27, 41, beginning, so also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocking him. It's not bad enough that they put Jesus through everything they put him through, the beatings and, and, and all the stuff, and they put him on the cross to kill him, but while he's up there, they're mocking him. And here's what they said, save others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe him. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So you can imagine that. Not only are the people down there shouting and screaming and all these things, but, but you're dying with two other men, and, and even there, one on the right, one on the left, even they're making fun of you. Isn't that so? Normally when, when prisoners are, are dying, they're all kind of in the same boat. But you see them making fun of Jesus. Also Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah, he, uh, complained that ridicule came to him from a public and, and from his own family. Jeremiah, you know, is a prophet of God. Jeremiah wrote the book of Jeremiah. He looked, wrote the book of Lamentations. He's active in uh, the time of the Babylonian captivity. And so he's a, a he also, his contemporaries are Ezekiel and, and so, and Daniel. And so we see him writing in this time period and, but his own, the public is ridiculed, and his family is ridiculed, and it was undoubtedly this difficulty that caused him to want to give up speaking in the name of God. Jeremiah 20, verse 7 through 10 says this, O Lord, you have deceived me. This is Jeremiah talking to God. God, I'm down 
here prophesying for you. I'm trying to do what I can for, for your people. And, and then he says this. You've deceived me, God. I was deceived. You are stronger than I. You have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a diversion all day long. If I say I'll not mention him or speak any more of his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary without holding it in. And I cannot. For I hear many whisperings. Terror is on every side. Denounce him. Let, let him denounce him. With all my close friends. Watching from for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our refuge with him. So even the prophet of God, that's you know talking about the top ten list, Jeremiah is somewhere in there. I've heard the same speech, a little different from preachers. And the God, why did you put me in this odd situation? Or this horrible situation. So later, Jeremiah was beaten and put in prison. Jeremiah 37, verse 15, the and the office, the officials, excuse me, were enraged at Jeremiah. They beat him and imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, for it he had been made a prisoner. Then it goes on. He was put in a muddy cistern from which he was rescued by Ethiopian in Jeremiah 38, 6 through 13. And according to the tradition, Jeremiah was stoned, verse 37, by the Jews in Egypt. So did he have call? But we know when we pick up, pick up our Bible, we read the book of Jeremiah, we read the book of Lamentations, we would still put Jeremiah with his faith in the top ten. Prophets. Remember, this is sharpening the bed, sharpening your sword. Well, finally, Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, was put to death by Jehoaz, the king of Judah. If you know anything about Jehoaz, the king of Judah, he was a bad king, one of the worst kings that Judah had ever seen or had ever had. You see, in 2 Chronicles, Chapter 24, verses 20 through 22. Then the Spirit of the Lord clothed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, and he stood above the people and said, Thus says the Lord God, Why do you break the commandments of the Lord that you, so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. So here's, you know, what's he doing? He's prophesying, he's preaching, he's sharing the word. But they conspired against him. By command of the king, they stoned him with the stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Well, that might remind you of somebody in the New Testament. I hope it does. Stephen. Stephen preached a sermon in the book of Acts, and, and as he preached the sermon, he, he kind of got bold in his preaching. And he called them stiff neck, and you look at your father's religion, and, and they didn't like his method and, and his delivery, and they stoned him to death. As they laid their clothing and their coats and things that they took off so they get a good throw in at the feet of Saul, which would someday become the Apostle Paul. They conspired against him, and by command of the king, they stoned him. Verse 22, thus. Joaz, the king, did not remember the kindness that Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, had shown him, but killed his son. And when he was dying, he said, May the Lord see and avenge. For the Lord himself alluded to this type of treatment in 
Matthew 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets. Stones those who are sent to it. How often would I gather you children together as a hen gathers her bra under her wings and you were not willing. Well, apparently some Hebrew Christians had gone through this kind of abuse. Hebrews 10, verse 33, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach, the Hebrew writer would say, and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. We'll close with Hebrews 13, verse 13, Therefore, let us go outside the camp, and bear the reproach he endured. It's about sharpening our faith, isn't it? I, I hope that none of us have to go through some of the things that we talked about tonight to, to sharpen our faith. But, but if we do go through things in life, we know that God is on our side and, and we know there seems to be a way out the other side and, and those things should make us stronger in the faith and certainly not weaker. Remember I said this at the very beginning. If Satan hasn't put a stumbling block in your path, then maybe you're not doing everything right you should. Because if Satan's not going to answer your door, then you should, then, then you're certainly a threat to him. He's not going to want you talking to your friends and neighbors about Jesus. He's not going to want you to, to, to spend more time in the Word. He's not going to want you to spend more time in prayer. He's not going to want you to have anything to do with the church or the church's people. Drop, try everything he can to drag you down, drag you out, drag you away. And the key word there is drag. Because that's what he does. These people went through horrible times. But it's a faith sharpening experience. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to do that. We know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he loves us so much. And he bled and died for us so that we can go to heaven and, and have an eternity with him in heaven. And, and if you're not a Christian, we encourage you to do that tonight. Or perhaps you struggle, or you need prayers of encouragement. We'll pray with you, pray for you. Why don't you come as we stand as we sing? I have decided to follow. Supper, which we'll do at this time. Let's give thanks for Jesus and the life he led, the examples he left us, and most of all for his sacrifice and his love. Let's give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to assemble here today, worship you, Heavenly Father, and praise you. We 
We thank you for your son. Thank you for his sacrifice and his love. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless the bread and bless those who partake of it. In Christ's name we pray. give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, once again we come before you thanking you for the opportunity to surround this table. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we'll always remember that the blood that was shed, shed to the last drop, Heavenly Father, was nothing but love for us. We pray, Lord, that you bless us through the wine and bless those who partake of it. In Christ's name we pray. This will conclude the Lord's Supper. I also have the opportunity to lay by in the store. We haven't done so. Any other announcements need to be made? Say a prayer. Let me just know. Gracious Father, thank you for the day of life we've enjoyed. Pray, Heavenly Father, for the sake of our number. We ask you to be with them. We pray, Lord, for those outside of Christ. We ask you, Heavenly Father, give them another opportunity to lay hold of their salvation, Lord, before it's everlastingly too late. We ask you to go with us now, Lord. Protect us, keep us safe. In the end, we ask you for that home in heaven. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.